welcome to this session dedicated to migrating from Oracle Data Warehouse and IBM Data Stage to Databricks on AWS. With me today, Himanshu Aurora. He's a resident solution architect at Databricks, part of the professional services in France. And myself, I'm Ben Hamza, so I'm a specialized solution architect in migration, myself also based in France. For our talk today, we'll go through the, uh, the following agenda. So we'll start by uh, speaking together about uh, what are the migration pillars? What are the steps you have to consider when migrating to will it be a data warehouse or Hadoop? After that, we'll um, dive into how you could modelize your data schema when you will be migrating to Databricks via some examples of uh, star schema, data vault. After that, we'll go to more concrete example of uh, code from Oracle and how it maps to Databricks. This will be my part. The second part will be led by uh, Himanshu. Will, he will be speaking about the project he implemented at SNCF. So it's a railway company in, uh, in France. He'll be detailing what was the lake house architecture he implemented and also all the learnings from this project. And hopefully time allows and we can get some questions. Well, so when you are migrating to the HRBRICS, these will be, what you can see on the screen, these will be the steps you will go through. And in the center, you have what is really specific to, to, to our migration. We'll start with the data migration. So here we mean data migration in more in a semantic way and also the physical way. Semantically, we were thinking about how should I migrate my data model. Most of the companies today, they have the star schema. And they'll be thinking, should I keep my star schema? Should I keep the same model or should I change it? Uh, also, should I keep the same dimension? I'll be speaking later on about some, uh, some, some ways to, to do it here. Also, physically, some, some companies are saying, I have terabytes of data. I have 30 years of historical data. Should I migrate all my data? Or should I migrate maybe just the data I need? So this is some of the question we ask when we are speaking about data migration. The second pillar here is about ETL and pipeline. ETL could be done for a data warehouse using a graphical user interface like Talent or Informatica. Could be also done via scripting with PL SQL code, BTEC in Teradata or whatever. So the idea would be how I would like to implement my, my next ETL pipeline of Databricks. Should I would like to keep graphical user interface or should I move, for instance, to PySpark or Scala? Orchestration also matters here. We have some customers using their ATF for orchestration. Some others will be using uh, shell script for, for orchestration. Some others will build, build the REST API for orchestration. So the idea to say, should I keep the same way to orchestrate or should I change it? Last but not the least is the BI part and the BI application here. And most of the time when migrating to data bricks, will it be for Hadoop or data warehouse, we tend to keep BI intact because behind the scene you have thousands of reports and don't want to work with them from scratch. So the idea here is try when rebuilding your data warehouse to keep the presentation layer intact. What I mean by the presentation layer is the data that you're exposed to your BI application, could be Power BI and so on. So this is really critical when migrating to be aware that what are the data I'm exposing to my BI application and keep them as much as possible intact. Okay, so these are the three pillars I wanted to start uh, our uh, talk with. And now let's dive a bit into how we will modelize your data. So these are seven steps we wanted to share with you, and this is what, what our, most of our customers migration are adopting. The first one is to say that will it be or to the origin or start schema or the Kimball or the Inman or the data vault, this kind of way to modelize data are compatible with the lake house. So this will not be a big jump, I would say, in, um, in these bricks will have still the same thinking. However, most, most probably, and I'm quite sure, you will be able, you will be denormalizing your model because keeping the normalized way to have your data model is an anti pattern. So you will be denormalizing your model, the first thing. The second thing I'm suggesting here is that reconsider also your dimensions. Just from my past experience, I used to work for a, uh, for a company where we have several layers of, of, uh, of product. First line of product, the second line, and so on. So if you keep the same model to, to Databricks, you will have endless join. So reducing the, the number of dimension and the level of dimension is really cri cri critical when you move into the lake house. 
The second recommendation here is to use Delta as the de facto way to store your data for two main reasons. The first one is that it's free to ensure, and ensure your data quality, given the ACID properties, and also ensure the, the performance and keep, keep your data, um, I would say keep the performance of your queries stable across the time. And also use Photon as much as possible. Photon is used by default for the BI workload, and you can also use for ETL when doing your uh, when doing your ETL for like for like for example for the app search for DV app search for the joint photon is really uh, powerful. In order to not fall into the problem of small file uh, paradigm, op uh, use the command optimize in order to compact your file as much as possible. So this is really great to keep the same performance for your your queries. The same way you, you will index your data in. Oracle or, or in Teradata, use also, you will index data also in, in the lake house. So the Z order command will help you also to index your data according to the most used uh, columns in your predicate. So don't hesitate to combine optimize with Z order that are really great commands in order to, to keep a good shape of your data. Also, something that we do a lot in Oracle, and I used to do it a lot in Oracle or, or Teradata, is to calculate the statistics for the optimizer and, the, for, and the, for the engine. So the same way, we have an analyze command in Databricks that will calculate the statistic, store them at the meta store level for the cost optimization decision to be, to be taken. Last but not the least, caching data is really great. So you could either cache part of your data on a DBSQL endpoint or cache your whole table this will be great as well for the BI application. Diving a little bit then on the data modeling. So here you have an example of, this, of, a, star, of a star schema where we aggregated as much as possible the dimensions. Something people are familiar with is the primary key and foreign key in, uh, in data warehouses. Given the syntax of our SQL, you will be able to define the primary key and the foreign key. However, you will not be able to enforce this, uh, this constraint. Nevertheless, you will be able to use this information when exploring your data model enter under our UI, and this information is really key for applications like Power BI and Tableau when you are building your business model in this application. However, on the other side, you are still able to, to, to create your identity column. So this is auto-increment integer that you can define on your tables, and later on, use this identity column as a surrogate key for your joints. So this is a highly recommended when implementing your delta tables. Also, maintaining data consistent and checking the business rule and also technical rules is important, as you may know, for data warehouse. The check command is made of that, and I will show you an example later on. Definitely, the star schema is one of the most used today uh, data models in the industry. However, more and more customers now tend to use Data Vault because it offers great flexibility. So what customers will do is that they will build their Data Vault, keep intact the hub and the link, and keep changing their satellite. So I have a customer, for instance, they migrated from Star Schema in SQL Warehouse to, data, to a data Vault in Databricks because in the past, their data model kept changing and they adopted Data Vault in order to keep the contract with the other teams intact and keep changing their data. And we recommend when implementing Data Vault on Lakehouse to adopt these five, let's say, areas ranging from staging, ingestion part, the silver layer, this will be really the core place where you will define your, your vault, and at the presentation layer, I've seen even some customers implementing a star schema at the affirmation uh, Mart, you know, to expose it to Power BI. So it's also possible to combine the two, data vault for the silver part and start schema for, for the presentation part. With that, I'm closing the, the data migration part and moving to the ETL. So through the coming slide, I would like just to show you how compatible, I would say, Databricks is for Oracle migration. We start with data types, then we'll see after that how you can load data using Databricks. we we'll see later on how you can create your data objects via some DDL statements, how to manipulate data via the DML, and how you can also map your, uh, your PLSQL code to PySpark. So the most used data types in 
in, in the scripts, will it be character, numeric, or whatever, they are mapped to, to those in, in, uh, in uh, Databricks. So characters are mapped to strings without any surprise here. Most numeric types are also mapped, most of the time we'll be using either big ints for uh, identity column or float for, for, for the rest. Date and timestamp mapped out identically and binary for the, for the, for the BLAB. So here, there are, we haven't really find any issue when, when migrating to Databricks related to data types. Speaking now about how to load uh, the data, so there are different ways to load data in, um, in Oracle. One of those is load data command. In Databricks, we, we map this to copy into. And you could see here that the, the command, they have quite the same, the same options. You can define the structure of your data. You could define also where you would like to store the bad record and some other option like separator. So this is what our customers are doing. If you would like to map like for like command, they will adopt copy into to replace load data. When it comes now to create tables via the data description language command, we have quite the same syntax here. Uh, except some exceptions here, like you have, you can define your uh, identity claim on nil, which you cannot do in Databricks in the first example. The second example here, we don't support unicity. What customers will do, that they will define a primary key like this column A1, and later on in the process in the ATL, they will be uh, ensuring that this column is really unique. So we don't enforce unicity in Databricks because this is a multi-pattern when you are streaming data, for instance, or loading huge volume of data. However, later on, you can enforce this, this rule, and Himanshu will be giving you some examples. Still here, about creating data, you could see that even though in Oracle we can have everything bulked in one statement, in Databricks we can have the same logic but separate in two statements. And even more than that, you can even add constraints or to, to implement your data quality and business rules after you created your table via the check commands I was mentioning before. Moving now to the data, data manipulation language, one of the most used commands is the app search. Uh, I mean, app search covering via the merge into command. And in Databricks, we have quite a, a perfect uh, matching, as you can see on the screen. Most of, most of your queries will be mapped uh, quickly and uh, migrated uh, in a fast way. Now, let's see this conditional insert that I used to do myself in, in the past, where you pack all your logic of, of um, business cases in one statement. In Databricks, this, this will be mapped to two different statements as shown in the example, but it's still possible, to, I would say, to, to map this kind of code into Databricks code in a SQL fashion. Regarding PLSQL code, so here we have uh, a case where we're declaring some variables and we have running a, a SQL statement. In Databricks, this will be mapped to declaration of, the, of, of, of uh, variables without specifying the, the type because we have dynamic typing in Python and we are encapsulating the SQL into a Spark SQL uh, function and we are getting the output of the select into a Python dictionary. So you can see here that the select was kept intact, in, in but we add just some wrappers around the, the existing code. Similarly here, you could say that we have a, a case when logic that maps easily to a if else logic in, in, in Databricks in a Py, uh, PySpark uh, code. When it comes now to factor your code and build models on Oracle, most of the time you will be either using functions or using stored procedure. In Databricks, this will map to a, a Python function uh, most of the time, where you could see that the logic built here in SQL, as in the, the, the previous example, is wrapped into a Spark SQL call, and the output, again, is mapped into a Python dictionary. Something to note here is that in the faction you can see here, the, the, global, the, the variable defined early in, the, in, 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 this, in this code is exposed out of this function. You could do so as well. So you could expose also variable out of your function via the spark.cof.set command, which exposes this variable in the Spark context. So there is no block it, there is blocking, I would say, topic here on migrating this PLC equal code. With that, I completed my part, and I'm passing it to 
Himanshu to, to speak about his project. Thanks, Ali. Okay, so in the second part of this presentation, I'm gonna talk about uh, one of the migration projects that I worked on for SNCF. So SNCF is the French National Railways and Transportation Company. Uh, this project was for real estate entity of SNCF. They have been using Oracle Data Warehouse and IBM Data Stage for ETL uh, quite a while, and they wanted to move away from that because uh, uh, these solutions are quite costly. They didn't want to renew the licenses. Secondly, uh, these solutions are not scalable. You can imagine like adding more compute to your on-premise data warehouse, how difficult it can be. And lastly, like they do not support uh, streaming use cases or anything around machine learning and AI. That's why they decided to move away from these solutions and they chose Databricks on AWS. Okay, now let me give you some context about this uh, project. So SNCF uh, collaborated with our professional services team, which is like the consulting side of the house of Databricks uh, to work on this project. The goal was to migrate the first data application uh, to the lake house architecture, which had like around 30 plus uh, tables. Our goal was to lead the lake house architecture and design, uh, lead the development of the pipelines, make sure that you know the teams are following uh, Spark and Delta and Databricks best practices, and also uh, software engineering best practices in general. Okay, now I'm gonna go a bit more uh, technical into the, the architecture that we implemented. Before I do that, I'm gonna just uh, quickly walk you through some high-level mappings between uh, on-prem data warehouse and lake house architecture. So in any uh, on-prem uh, data warehouse, you would have these kind of uh, layers, staging, where you have your raw data coming, coming in on daily basis. Then you will have this ODS layer, which is called operational data store, which kind of represents you know, the uh, current snapshot of all the tables. And then lastly, you will have this data warehouse layer where you will build your star schema. And then on top of that, you can build your data marts, which are like more like pre-joined, pre-aggregated tables on which you can plug your BI tools, right? So this uh, nicely maps to Databricks lake house architecture. Your staging area maps to bronze layer, your ODS maps to silver, and then in the gold layer is the, the, the place where we implement the star schema. Okay, and this is the target architecture that we implemented at SNCF. For the ingestion part to landing zone, so uh, basically there was a separate team taking care of ingestion, and they have been using Apache NiFi. So for those who don't know NiFi, NiFi comes with the Hortonworks and Cloudera bundle. Uh, it's a graphical tool to you know connect with different source applications like Salesforce, like SAP, and it can pull data from those applications and drop files in your cloud storage, like everything uh, using the UI. So in our case, uh, NiFi was dropping CSV files on daily basis in the landing zone in S3. Then to move data from landing to bronze layer, uh, we used Autoloader. So Autoloader is the framework or tool on Databricks platform that allows you to um, read files from cloud storage and then ingest them into a Delta table. One thing that was quite, uh, just uh, one more point on autoloader. So basically it uses Spark streaming behind the scene. So you get all the goodness of streaming uh, with autoloader. One thing which is quite specific in this architecture is that in the bronze layer, uh, we had only one generic delta table for each data application. And that was by, by choice. So basically whatever be the structure of your CSV file, that will end up in the same uh, generic delta table. Uh, this is called multiplexing architecture, and I'll uh, touch upon this in the coming slides as well. Then to move your data from bronze to silver, uh, we used standard Spark batch processing on Databricks. So in the silver layer, we started adding structure to our data. So this is where we uh, you know, perform schema validation, made sure that the, the target tables that we are creating, uh, you know, uh, the, the data that is uh, getting inserted uh, follows the desired schema, right? And all the records that was not following or not complying the schema, they ended up in a quarantine zone in, in JSON files. So basically in this layer, we had as many delta tables as the type of you know, CSV files. And lastly, to move from silver to gold, Again, we used standard Spark batch, batch processing on Databricks. So this is the layer we, where we implemented you know, star schema. We had our uh, dimension tables, our fact tables. So dimension tables uh, are usually you know, SCD type two tables where you keep the current version of your data as well as the historical versions. 
So to perform uh, these kind of operations, you would need something like upsert, and that's uh, where we heavily you know, used delta merge command. Now I'll go a bit more detail, uh, into details uh, about the implementation of each of these uh, layers. So for the landing zone, I already mentioned that we were uh, using Apache NiFi for uh, ingesting data to uh, landing zone. There was uh, one constraint coming from the source applications that they could not provide us the incremental you know, files on daily basis. They were giving us full uh, volume of data on daily basis. But that was not a big issue in this project because the data application that we were migrating, the whole data was around 100 GB or so, so we could easily you know, ingest that much, of, that much of data on daily basis. The format of source files is CSV, but as you can see on the screen, uh, it was not a standard CSV. Uh, it had like French characters, so it was not UTF-8 format. It was uh, ISO 88591 encoding. And you can see like we had like two header files, which, oh, sorry, two header rows, first one containing the, the, let's say the source name, then the second one containing the column names. Then even in the data, you can see like we have French characters, we have double quotes, semicolons, and even for the separator, it's not a standard separator, but we are using pipes. So obviously it's not a standard CSV uh, that we get from the source. That's why when we started ingesting this uh, using autoloader, uh, we first went with the text format, given that it's not a standard CSV uh, format. But pretty soon we had an issue. Uh, like when you read text data with Spark, Spark only supports UTF-8 encoding. So in our case, since we had some French characters, so obviously all of those characters were corrupted. That's why we had to kind of fall back to the CSV format. Uh, with autoloader, and in this, uh, like in this scenario, you can definitely specify your uh, source encoding. I mentioned earlier that in the bronze layer, we only had one single generic delta table for whatever be the structure of, our, of, of, your, of your data. So the idea was that for all the CSV files that we are ingesting, we would like to ingest all the data rows in a single generic column as a string. So this is called like multiplexing architecture. How you can achieve that? Uh, the way to achieve it is to define your separator uh, symbol that should never be present in your data. So in that case, Spark will never split your rows into multiple columns, and all the columns will end up as a string in the single generic column, in our case, like the first column by default, which is named as underscore C0. Secondly, like we uh, remove the first header row because uh, that only had the source name and which we can also get from this input file name function that comes from the standard Spark API. Second row was you know, containing the head, uh, column names, so we kept it as data because we need the column names later on uh, when we apply structure to our data in the silver layer. We also added two extra columns uh, in this table. Uh, first one is source type, basically the, the structure type or the, let's say the file type, and the second one is the execution date. And lastly, although autoloader uses Spark streaming, but you can still run it as a batch uh, processing using trigger once mode. Okay, again on the bronze layer, so I mentioned that we uh, created two extra columns, execution date and the source type. So we, we actually partition that generic table on these two columns, and this is to take advantage uh, of partition pruning when we are querying these, this table for the silver layer uh, creation. And uh, for the writing part, we deliberately chose to um, write in append mode because this gives us the possibility to rerun the job. It might happen in some cases that there are a couple of files which are arriving late. So to kind of backfill those uh, late arriving files, uh, we inserted the, uh, the data in the append mode. With that, there was a, let's say a consequence is that since uh, each day we are getting full volume, uh, so basically each day's partition would have a lot of data and your table will grow uh, by day. So th uh, that's why we had to kind of run this delete uh, delta command on daily basis to manually you know, uh, delete the partitions older than seven days and also run vacuum regularly to make sure that we are physically deleting the parquet files. Moving on to silver layer. So as I mentioned earlier, this is the layer where we started adding structure to our data. So basically we had as many tables as different type of, type of CSV files. Uh, so basically we kind of looped over all the target tables and then uh, for schema validation, like we stored our uh, schema files as metadata files in S3, in JSON formats, any row that doesn't match the desired schema, uh, you know, would end up in a quarantine zone in JSON format. So this is how we kind of, you know, uh, kind of implemented the schema validation part in the silver layer. And we uh, 
wrote in the, the overwrite mode because even if you have to rerun the job in the silver layer, we can easily do that because we still have the source data available in the bronze layer. Okay, for the gold layers, so as I mentioned earlier in the, in the architecture uh, slide, uh, this is where we implemented the star schema. So this is where we created our, our you know, our dimension tables and, and fact tables. Uh, dimension tables are obviously SCD type two tables that will have you know your current versions of, of your data as well as historical records. So we had to kind of use data merging uh, operation there heavily to, to perform these kind of operation. Uh, secondly, um, when you join your dimensions with your fact, you need some sort of primary key, so which is called surrogate key. Back then, delta identity column feature was not available. So we had to kind of you know, choose a couple of business columns for each table and then uh, generate uh, MD5 hashing uh, from those columns to generate that unique key. But if I have to do it today, obviously I'll go uh, with this delta identity column feature because it's an auto-incremented integer for, uh, for each row in your table. So it gives you that uh, uh, you know, unicity for each row easily. And on, on top of that, since it's an integer value, if you perform z-ordering or indexing on that column, uh, the data skipping is gonna be much better than compared to MD5, which is just you know a random hex string. Lastly, um, so when you perform merge, uh, delta merge operation, basically behind the scene, Spark is gonna do joins, right? And it can be a very slow operation. So we, whenever we do merges, we try to skip data as much as possible so that merges can go faster, right? So for that, we actually used one business fact that only the current version of your data can be updated or deleted, right? Anything which is historical will never change. It's immutable, right? And we had this uh, column in all the fact and dimensions called record active, which is a Boolean column, just you know, pointing whether a record is a current record or whether it's a historical record. So what we did that we actually partitioned our tables on this column so that we have like two partitions, first one containing historical records, second one containing current records. And since we knew that the merge operation will only work on the partition with the active records, so we like we uh, categorically passed this record active uh, equals true filter in all the merge uh, command conditions so that we can skip the whole historical records and you know, uh, uh, the merge operation can, can go really, really fast. Okay, so we also had this last uh, consumption layer where we had to push some, some data from delta to redshift, and I'll let you know why we had to do that. Basically, SNCF had some business application like web application and mobile application that needed to interact with this gold uh, layer delta table, but they can only interact with these tables using Rust API. Back then, it was not possible on Databricks to query a delta table using Rust API. That's why we had to choose redshift. But if you have to implement it as of today, uh, you don't need to do that. You can go full lake house architecture for that because now on Databricks SQL, you have this statement execution API that allows you to query your delta tables using REST protocol. Anyways, back then it, it was not possible, so we went with Redshift, but there, there were a couple of you know, issues with the Redshift Spark driver, like it cannot perform merges, it cannot do delete, it cannot do update, it can only do insert and overwrite. So we had to kind of work around our way, like creating some current tables, some historical tables. So yeah, it was a messy solution, it worked. So the, the message here is that if you have to do this as of, uh, as of today, just uh, use the Databricks SQL REST API to query your data from delta tables. Okay, so that was the, the whole uh, technical architecture for this project. Now I'm gonna share a couple of outcome or let's say KPIs that were calculated by customer itself. So after moving to Databricks, uh, they had like 70% of cost reduction uh, compared to what they were you know, uh, paying earlier with uh, Oracle and data stage. And secondly, they only had 13 days of consulting with Databricks professional services team. And with, with only these 13 days, they had like approximately one year worth of acceleration for this migration project. Okay, in the last section, I will uh, share some of the best practices that we applied in this project that you can use in any data project for that matter. We only use notebooks in this project, but having said that, we made sure that we were following all the you know, software development best practices, like 
we made sure that we were creating modular Python functions, uh, which are deterministic, taking data frame in, data frame out, doing some business logic, but not doing any side effects, you know, like not writing to, to S3 or Kafka, or any of those things, so that we can easily reason about them as well as unit test them, right? So as you can see, the same function uh, uh, here, I've like I've, uh, unit test tested this using a Python unit test library. We also made sure that we were following, you know, all the Python doc string conventions. The code was, you know, properly formatted so that, you know, uh, it's uh, maintainable in, in, the, in the long term. You can use it, uh, format it using Python formatter uh, online, available online, or you can now easily do it on the new uh, notebook editor as well. Okay, so in the architecture slide, I mentioned that in the silver layer, we uh, add structure to our data and any rows that were not following the desired schema, they ended up in the quarantine zone. So how we implemented that, we did not you know, reinvent the whole wheel. Uh, we just used the existing bad record path option in Spark API. Basically, you have to provide a path and a desired schema, and any row that doesn't match with that schema would end up in that bad record path automatically in JSON file format. So basically, daily, on daily basis, we were getting those JSON files, then we had a technical job kind of you know, uh, scanning those files, writing data to Delta, then we calculated some technical KPIs like number of rows rejected on daily basis for each source, then we kind of built some uh, time series graph using those KPIs. So yeah, it was pretty simple to implement. Okay, and lastly, we also uh, applied some Spark optimizations uh, to make sure that whenever we are doing merges and joins, you know, we can uh, basically make our uh, ETL pipelines run as fast as possible. So first of all, we made sure that we can take advantage of broadcast join as much as possible. That's why we you know, increase the threshold to 200 MB. And also when you are doing a lot of broadcast, make sure to increase this uh, driver max result size parameter because broadcast happens through driver. So if you don't increase it, you might run into some, some errors. Also, we made sure that our shuffle partitions were properly tuned. So in this project, we did not, like, we did not do some fi fancy fine tuning. We just went with our rule of thumb that every time I do shuffle, I'm gonna put it to three times my number of CPU cores so that at least I can, I can make sure that every time, the, every time there is a shuffle happening, all the CPU cores are being properly used to make that uh, you know, uh, shuffle operation go faster. Because by default, this value is 200, which is obviously, in most cases, will not work out for you. For Delta uh, merge operation, so we uh, made sure that we were using DBR runtime 10.4 and above. Uh, because uh, with these uh, runtimes, you have this low shuffle merge feature, which is automatically you know turned on, so that your merges can go even faster. We also kind of you know uh, use this uh, auto optimize uh, file compaction uh, feature from Delta, so that we get a nice approximately 128 MB file size. This also helps a lot in in, in you know in uh, many operations like merges. And uh, lastly, uh, some other recommendations. So definitely for all the ETL jobs that uh, we built in this migration project, we were using Databricks workflows to orchestrate those jobs. Uh, we use Databricks repos to version our code, as well as, you know, uh, we kind of take advantage of repos API to implement CI CD pipelines. Last two things we did not use in this project, but, but I would still like to kind of highlight that you can definitely look into these things. Uh, first one is BladeBridge. So BladeBridge is a technology partner of Databricks that can automatically convert your, you know, IBM data stage pipelines, which are, you know, graphical pipelines, uh, uh, into, uh, like it can convert them into PySpark code automatically for you. Secondly, you can use data live tables. So data live tables is a managed ETL framework on Databricks, uh, which, you know, uh, can really help accelerate the migration because it allows developers to focus on business logic, business code, without you know having to worry about the, the operational part of your uh, pipeline execution. And also, it comes with a nice uh, data quality framework. And I think with that, uh, I'm done. This was my last slide, and we still have five minutes left, so probably you can take a couple of questions. <laughs> 